Okay. Well, apart from being an all-round superstar, Joanna uh, is self-evidently an art historian and curator. Yes, yes. Um, she has also been a board member of uh, research of museums and galleries at Art Gallery New South Wales and a member of the editorial board of Art in Australia, a member of the Art Australia China Council, a member of Visual Arts and Crafts Committee of the New South Wales Ministry for the Arts, and a member of the SOCOG and SOCOG. Mm -hmm. Okay. Public Arts Advisory Committee. Uh, more importantly, she was chair of the Art Curator, the Children's Hospital, Westmead, for 21 years. She has published books and numerous articles in a variety of publications on European art and history, Chinese art, industrial archaeology, and on the work of Anne Thompson, and has asked as part of Healing Environment. So, Jana, you lecture here and in Australia, I think, as well, don't you? I have a lecture for yeah. Well, very warm <laughs> so welcome to you. I have turned off my telephone this time. Oh, you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Last time we were interrupted. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. I think I'm going to pass this to you. Thank you. Is, this, is this working? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, and the only other thing I'm going to ask is how I'm going to work the slides. So these. Ooh, and what's more? Sorry. Let's just make a little bit like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, right, can we go backwards? Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, and um, one one more thing. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I need my glasses. I'm just going to get them out of my bag. <laughs> sorry, I just need my glasses. <laughs> I realise. Oops. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, I'm going to talk about Anne Thompson, who is an Australian um, artist. Um, she's one of the leading abstract artists. Um, but actually, like many artists, she doesn't actually see herself like that. Um, she sees herself as an artist. And when she was asked um, in an interview if she was an abstract or a figurative painter, she simply replied, yes. Um, and abstract art had a very slow beginning in Australia. Um, while some artists began to paint in semi-abstract works uh, between the First and the Second World Wars, it was not really until the 1950s that more Australian artists began to embrace and explore it. Um, the impetus for this was twofold. In 1953, an exhibition um, called French Paintings Today was brought to Australia and shown in all our state um, art galleries um, and um, it included such artists as uh, Picasso, Chagall, Serrat and Masson and this was the first time that um, many Australian artists and indeed many Australians had actually seen um, had seen contemporary art and abstract art um, when it wasn't in a book. Um, it's called John Olson um, and it was, um, as you can see, it was really, this was part, I mean, this came as quite a, a sort of shock to the Australian public because they'd not been aware of this sort of work before. Um, in fact, um, the exhibition was seen as a challenge in what became a fiercely contested debate between, um, of the, of the, between the merits of abstract and figurative art, um, which range in Australia in the 1950s and 1960s, mainly between artists in the two main state capitals, Sydney and Melbourne. In 1960, in response to Direction One, seven, Mel seven Melbourne artists held an exhibition called Anticipian to defend the traditional figurative art, which in their eyes was the only legitimate form of painting. They issued a manifesto which asserted that the arts of action painters, geometric abstractionists, and abstract expressionists was not an art sufficient for our times, nor an art for living men. They presumably didn't care about women, but um, that was very, um, and this was, it was a very bitter battle. Um, there were allegations, in fact, that abstract art was non-Australian. This is actually a very, very provocative um, insult in Australia. Um, 
So Anne was growing up in Queensland's capital, Brisbane, and going to art school there, and was remote from the fierce battle that was raging between the two sides. Um, although, when she was asked to draw the kangaroo on, the, on, the, on a coin, she realized that um, this was not the sort of art that she wished to do. So um, she, um, in 1956, she made the decision to move to Sydney. And she arrived there in time to see and be excited and enthused by Direction One. She also enrolled in the East Sydney Technical College, um, which is now the where she John where John Olson and, and John Passmore were teaching, and Tony Tuxton was a frequent visitor. She also visited um, 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 an artist called Ian Fairweather, who was very Reclusive, um, she used to visit him on um, on Bribey Island, saying you could smell him before you could see him. Um, but I mean, he he was uh, he was a, he was born in England, and had studied in China or went to China and painted in China and ended up in Australia. But he was very um, and he was very influential for Anne. Um, she um, she also had a number of discussions with artists. Um, about the work that she that she was really interested in seeing, and it was the paintings she saw in Direction One and the conversations that she had with these artists who were exploring abstract art, which led her to understand she what that she how she wanted to paint. She says she realized she did not want to paint things; she wanted to paint something other. She, for her, painting is like composing music searching to express something which is not there in front of her. She quickly developed an abstract style of her own and was determined to avoid having the, having any one artist um, have sway over her work. She was determined to be completely individual. Though she looked at other people's art, was very interested in what they were doing, she was absolutely determined that her work was going to be her work. Um, she, um, in, 19, um, in 1963, she had her first solo exhibition um, in the Waters Gallery in Sydney. And from then onwards, she's had exhibitions of her work in most states in Australia, as well as in England, America, Belgium, China, Germany, Indonesia, Italy, and the Netherlands. Now, this comes the moment when I get... Did it come up? Yes, it did. Yeah. This is um, spring. It's the only it's the only known work that exists from that first exhibition that she held, and in it you see the beginnings of what is has uh, how, how her work continues. The sort of areas of great colours that she has, the just images that come and go. I mean the the sort of ways that she paints, that she moves about. The, the paint about and how she actually puts it onto the canvas. Um, um, it, it's um, she loves these vibrant, rich colours, um, which she and and those have to, and as you'll see, those have actually continued to um, to um, dominate her art. Um, in the um, in the sixties, Anne was also um, was also in, um, was also working in her interest of space and flight. She grew up in um, Queensland, um, at, which is a vast is a vast state, um, and she used to fly about it in small aeroplanes. And these works, as you can see, um, combine um, an inventive personal fantasy involving flight. And with using very brightly coloured, um, coloured childlike aeroplanes, parachutes, balloons, um, and with the colours that would actually show what she has always been interested in, which is land, sea, and air. Um, this is called Driftway, and it was painted in 1976, um, and it's acrylic on lint. Um, the wish to create space in her work has never left her, and it became more sophisticated after she visited New York in 1978, 
on her way to take up the first of her many residencies in Cité Internationale des Arts in Paris. The journey was extremely stimulating for her as she met and visited the studios of many contemporary artists in both cities, as well as seeing international collections for the first time. I think it's very difficult to realize when you live in England that how cut off Australia is from seeing many collections. We are only able to see what is, what is in our museums, our art galleries. Um, and of course, every, I mean, Anne's father um, had a, an art bookshop, which was quite rare in those days. And so she'd always studied art, but it was always in a book. And as I think you all know, looking at a painting in a book and then seeing the actual painting itself, it's, it's completely different. It gives you a completely different impression. Um, it's not just the size, it's the colors, it's everything that you do. So it was, it was, a, it was a great moment for Anne um, to actually to have that. Um, now, Anne absorbs everything she sees and um, she is resolute in saying her art comes from being an outside observer. She always paints in her studio. She never works in sketches. She works directly onto her canvas, which uh, moves from being on an easel to a floor to a wall to get the effect she requires. Um, when she begins to paint, she says that she is jumping into an open space. She never tries to force her the, or control her work and has no idea how the painting will end. What, appear, uh, what appears on her canvases are ideas which have worked their way through her. They, are, they, um, they come from within her. She, she's very interesting in that because, you know, when you sort of say, what were you sort of thinking about? And she says, I, I choose art, I choose the uh, direction, but it's not something I do. I feel I'm doing. It's, I, it is done for me. Um, and um, she actually it, it really, she's unconsciously giving, gathering all these images through her life um, and they are never, and she always in, in, in emphasizes this, they're never the result of one particular place or in fact one particular image. Um, over the years she has examined various themes as well as flight and space. They've included sea, water, tribal and indigenous art and the landscape, including the vast um, landscape of Australia and the deserts there. Um, this um, image is when she was having, she had been looking at some um, Japanese uh, um, armor and she, that, these came out in her, in her work. Um, you, one of the things that happens with Anne's work, things become, you see things in one period, she may have painted, she paints on several canvases at the same time. So think, um, the art comes through, the dark colors, the, the sort of swathes of colors. You have an image, but you ha it's, a, it's still an abstract image. Um, this is, um, that, um, that one was um, called Ritual. Um, and it's sorry, it was 1987. This is the Northern Territory. Is the Northern Territories in 1994 to 1995, which is oil on board. Um, I don't know, but I'm sure many of you have heard of the Red Centre of Australia, and it's hard to believe that the colours are really this colour. Um, and I think that the other images come up, there's always something there. And she has, ca this, she has captured this space um, in, her, in this painting. Um, she's never satisfied with her own work. She says she's always trying to go somewhere further than I, than I know. She likes to push boundaries away. And although her works um, are tied to a single dimension, as paintings must be, her canvases have a three-dimensional quality into which your mind can fall. They reveal more and more as your eye wanders over the lines, planes, and colors. Images appear and disappear. They're interwoven 
with wandering horizontal lines, with areas of movement and depth created by patches of flowing colours, broken surfaces, a rich palette, and energetic brush strokes. They're not works you can scroll by. You must actually stop and look at them deeply. And as you do, your first impression vanishes, and you are, you're in a different world. And like Anne, the viewer is also on a journey of discovery. Anne thinks and paints in layers, pushing away a subject as it imposes itself, working against it. She builds up canvases, often putting thin paint over, paint over thick, at times letting the paint fall in its own volition, so it dribbles down the canvas. At other, at other times, she guides it with broad brush strokes um, and also um, uses um, to achieve, she achieves a tactile surface. You know, unfortunately, you really can't get that impression um, when you look at a photograph, but if you, there are two of her paintings in the, in the cafe, and I would urge you to look at that to get an impression of how, how she works and what she does. Um, she, um, she builds up the canvas. Um, she scratches, pulls, and scrapes the paint back using a scraper or trowel and even sandpaper and manipulates the painting to achieve a three-dimensional effect where the foreground unites with the background. Occasionally, she adds carved paper to achieve the effect she is searching for. Um, she likes to form a sense of space in the front of canvas, which adds to the mystery of the painting. The two um, paintings in the cafe actually do have some carved paper on that. She, she, it's a, it's, um, she likes, it's a sort of material she likes to use quite a lot in her, in her work. Um, she often paints the, she often manages to add a sort of mystery to her paintings by, paint, um, by placing an incongruous line across it, um, the bold colors. Um, so um, the painting appears suddenly to float. Um, and other times her paintings are full of nervous, Great searching calligraphy. She's very interested in calligraphy, um, and it appears in her. I mean, it doesn't appear as calligraphy, but she is very interested in the lines that you that Chinese calligraphy has. Um, this is ESGM, and it's 1984, and it's an oil. Her interest in water has been a lifelong obsession. She still swims every day in the ocean. Um, this led to the, uh, her working on impressions of Sydney Harbour um, in the 1980s. Um, and at the same time, she actually changed from painting in acrylics to painting in oils. The reason she did this um, was that um, she felt it, she had two young daughters at that time, and she felt it was a safer material um, with, uh, for, for the children to, to be about. Um, and of course, her work became deeper and more layered by when she did this. This is Sydney Waterfront, which is um, 1980s and is an or is um, oil on, on linen. The epitome of the theme, her, her theme of water, is ebb tide, which is a huge work. It's 400 by 550. It was commissioned by the Darling Harbour Authority in 1987. Um, when she was preparing for this work, Anne did make many sketches around the harbour, but she didn't use any of them in the painting, saying that they were um, that they were absorbed into her mind. Um, and when she was actually asked to describe this work, she said she was trying to capture water, capture water, wind, and space and the volumes of sails flapping and swaying across the water. And I think you, if you look at this, that she actually will get, you can see that impression. It's, it's a very, very marvelous work, actually. It's a fantastic work. Um, uh, Anne also had a, had a fascination with the vastness of Australian landscape, its color, the harsh, clear, harsh, clear light. Um, many of you have been to Australia, but the light is completely different. Um, very interesting. When Australia 
um, come to Australian artists, come to England or Europe, they're immediately realized this is, it's a softer light here. They find that very interesting. And I think when early Australian, uh, well, early Australian artists um, who come out from England and uh, the harshness of the light is something that see immediately when you get there. But I first went to Australia, I thought that I could contrasts are so great there. Um, and um, this is one of the things that uh, the light is um, and um, can, can continually returned to and explored. Um, this is Centrala. Um, 1989, uh, um, uh, Oil on Linen, um, which is, as you see, the, um, in this that she expresses the vastness of the country with the space. That's another extraordinary feeling when you go to the Australian countryside. You can, it's quite a lot of it's very flat. And you just have, even if you have a tiny rise, I mean, if I was standing on this, you, I would be above it. And you get this enormous feeling of space that you can stretch your arms forever. Um, and I think in this that she's in with having this, leaving the center I'm almost blank, that, that she's touched, that is one of the things that she's achieving in this. Um, this is Yellow Sign. Um, and it's um, 1998, and it's oil on linen. And it's capturing the vastness and the light of, of the Australian light. As I say, it's incredibly intense um, with just a few hints of the red earth and a little bit of, of, of the sky, the blue sky, um, which goes forever. Um, as I say, each theme has dominated her, her paintings at different times. Um, but they never really vanish. Um, they keep on. They keep on returning, um, and she uses them again and again. Um, but there's a the soft, quite often a, a reference, a different reference, an obsession, um, which appears in a completely different way. Um, and there's always the feeling that an old theme might one day emerge, and totally um, in, in a totally new presentation, while there's a still a promise of other themes to come. She works constantly, um, evolving each cam, and each ca canvas evolves every time. She's, as I say, she works on multiple ones. They're evolving as she as she works, and it, as every exhibition sort of progresses to the next stage of her work. Um, she works, as I said, on several canvases at a time, and it's very interesting because I mean, like, I visited her studio just before I came um, came to England. Um, and I was looking at the work she was were, she was working on, and I said, "Oh, it looks a bit like um, the dot paintings, the uh, indigenous dot paintings." That um, and she looked at it, and, and from slightly she was slightly surprised. Um, she looked at it, and she said, "Hmm, you might be right. It might even remain there when I finish the painting." As I say, she has no idea. She doesn't know how her paintings are going to end. She finishes them when she's satisfied with them. Um, um, the strength of her paintings has always been acknowledged. And describing her work, um, a critic described her work an early, an early, in an early and um, said that they um, were very rare to see I, such strong works in either a man or a woman. Um, and throughout her 70 plus years of her painting life, Anne's work has continued to remain very strong. Um, she, she continuously is an innovator, constantly increasing her will to explore the unknown, or she is, describes it as risking taking off from a cliff. Um, Tidal, which is 2003. Um, She's returned as she does, as she likes to do to her um, to the theme of water. You can see um, of the water that she gets. Um, 
we can see both in the sea and in the harbour, um, Sydney Harbour. Um, this is um, this is um, transition. Oh, this is Orion. Oh, no, this is Utopia. Sorry, 2012. Again, you can see how the, she has allowed the paint to dribble down um, the canvas to form its uh, to help form the painting that it might might happen. I mean, if she was unsatisfied with this, she would scrape it back and start again. But again, you've got the very bright very strong colors that she likes to use. Um, this, is, um, this is Orion. Again, bold colors, very bold colors. Um, again, the paint at the bottom of the painting is dribbling down. This is transition. Um, when I was talking to her about this, um, she said um, when she was painting a memory of a friend, um, came to her and emerged in in as this as this it's not a figure but a near figure that came out in her work. Um, this is um, 2003, a uh, 23, um, which is acrylic and is um, is for future landscape. Um, it, and in this work, she's used tarred paper. As I say, I do urge you to go and see that her, how she uses the tarred paper. She fixes it to the canvas, paints it off it, but of course it, it actually emerges in, a, in lots of different ways. And this one is, this one is um, called Mini Waters. Um, and it's another 2023 work um, with acrylic on Belgium linen. Um, it's um, one of one of her most recent works, and I think, as you can see, the strength and the promise of what was going to happen when we saw that first um, painting from her first exhibition is still there, but is developed in a different way. Um, she still works every day in her studio, um, and as one commenter commentator remarked, her work remains complex dense, often bewildering, but always beguiling and intriguing. And she's contained and remains her lifelong authentic authenticity of an urgency to create. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ooh, I better give you that too. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay, brilliant. There's a lot more fiddling and involvement in this series of symposium we've had before. So I'm sorry about the tech thing. Um, but we are actually streaming this as well um, for the benefit of uh, a wider audience, actually, who are interested to the point we just raised about Australia, um, and they're joining from there, and also uh, later on from Mexico as well. So um, apologies. Is it working okay in the back? I just wanted to ask. Okay, wonderful, brilliant. Um, super. Uh, okay, lovely. Super. So. Um, I thought what we would do just before we have a break and a cup of coffee, then come back for a conversation between Dawn and Joanna and just think a little bit about um, Joanna's uh, conversation and, and, and Anne's work. Um, she's an amazing woman, artist, Anne. I've met her. She does swim uh, in, the, uh, in the sea every morning. It's just Anne. It's the most beautiful part of, uh, of Sydney Harbour. And I've been there, I've seen her, uh, her studio and I've walked in there and we've looked at paintings together. Um, and you have to realize just how much of a headwind she was into going into her career, the sort of masculinity, if you like, which dominated the narrative there and the antithesis towards abstraction in, in any form. So um, as you might be beginning to uh, realize, I'm not David Anfam. Um, and um, whilst I think he might be coming later, he's certainly not with us here now. So I thought you might um, enjoy a few words. Um, that's about all I got. 
so uh, uh, somewhat impromptu on 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 Rose Hilton, um, because her story is a similar it's a similar sort of headwind, really. Um, if you are familiar with the 20th century British art, this is a lady who was born to a uh, Plymouth Brethren family in 1931 in Kent and Beckenham, and the thought of art as a sort of enterprise was heavily frowned upon. Um, so this was a lady who then went to London, who got involved with the Royal College of Art, who got a scholarship, who went to Rome, who then fell in love with someone called Roger Hilton, who was her senior, and very much the top flight of artists who were working in London today. And Roger said, Rose, we're going to Cornwall together. Well, of course we are. Um, and I'm going to be a fabulous painter, and we're going to have a family. And of course we are. So Rose put a career on hold. And Roger became a famous artist, as he said he would. Um, and then he died slowly of alcoholism. He poisoned himself to the end. And over that time, Rose, who had been painting quietly in the background, upstairs in the studio, um, began, if you like, to establish her own career. And Roger smelt the paint. He said, I can smell it on you, the Terps. Can you imagine? And he's in bed, crippled, a bottle of whiskey in the other hand. And he said, Rose, I'd love to help you, actually, because you're a better painter than me. So he did. And so you speak to Rose today about, well, you spoke to her, Rose. I, as an interjection, used to go down as a young boy uh, with my father, somewhat reluctantly, um, on these sort of dawn escapades to go and spend time in artist studios um, and heard and, and, and relate the stories. Rose has no capacity in her, had no capacity in her for regret, and she had no capacity, if you like, for resentment, despite of all of the um, headwinds that, that she was facing. Um, and her painting career took off, I think, perhaps with elements of lack of confidence, perhaps, in the first instance. But for me, I think her work is truly great when it comes to using color as empathy. And I think all of that trauma, I suppose, um, all of that willingness to forgive, all of that desire to be known and to be understood is there in those color pieces. So uh, her subject matter sometimes was frivolous. Um, we haven't got it here, but there's a picture called Sweb. It's a portrait of a naked man. Sweb turned up in the morning. I said, what's a funny name for a painting? What is it? He said, well, no, no, Sweb's amazing. It's the Southwest Electricity Board. He's such a lovely man. <laughs> it was a great portrait. And so Rose's work um, was anecdotal in a way in terms of her subject matter. But I think what she wanted to use was an idea of it as a start point for some of the empathy she wanted to say. So in a way, in some sense, it didn't matter. In some sense, it did matter what she was painting. Um, so the pieces we chose next door um, to sort of steer a little bit were I want to look at the abstract works more predominantly. There are some figurations, because I think when she lent into the figure, it became more Bonnard, it became more Matisse, um, and it's glorious, but it leads you in a different way. And I think the sort of the formal abstraction of, of the landscape and uh, interior land pieces that we've got of hers show that. Um, and I think for me, Rose's work sets us up quite well um, for a thought about how painting as a language in the hands of Anne um, and a language in the hands of Rose has got sort of glorious empathy, a quieter spoken language um, that we can enjoy today. These are now oldish paintings, they're from 2010 or 1995. Um, she was amazing. She had about five shows with my father. I was a sort of young boy to a young man over that time. And she used to come in and look around the pictures, and she had very blue eyes, and she looked at them, and if you like them, oh, that's lovely. Do you? Do you? Lovely. That's lovely. Um, and she'd wear a sort of a worn-out leather, a sort of woolen jacket. And then she disappeared and came in just about sort of 20 minutes past six, sort of opening at six o'clock, and the, the room is full. And she's bought a Givenchy dress, and she's head to toe in this glorious black one ball gown. And she comes in and transformed the shadow, and and held the evening. So um, she was a wonderful person. Um, 
we're very lucky to show her works here. And I think sometimes when we're looking at paintings, we're looking at people, really. So I hope some of that gives you a sort of a deeper insight into these works when you see them. So um, there we are. Um, there you would. <laughs> I'm, There's no rush. We're nicely on schedule, but I thought if we had a quick break, if, uh, please don't all, well, I'd love you to have a cup of coffee, um, but do take your time to have a look round. Don't rush at them at the same time because th there's only four hands and the rest of it. But um, we will come back here in, I think it's a, about half an hour or so, isn't it? And we'll have a conversation together. And I think we just might explore some of the conversation with Anne, um, perhaps some of the conversation with Rose, and particularly with reference to Dawn, about some of the sort of precepts of early painting, figurative painting, leading into abstraction, which seems to be a bit of a theme that's going through. We're finding a route for abstraction in figuration, it seems to me, as a general theme of today. Much better for it. Okay, thank you. 12, 12 o'clock. I feel I'm here slightly under false pretenses because although John Golding is one of the great abstract painters, I think, uh, my particular interest in him was in his earlier work, and I will be talking about that later on. But there's a peculiarity about John in that uh, he made a transition to abstraction in a very abrupt manner, unlike most artists who feel their way to it in some form. and Sometimes, in a sense, the distinction between abstraction and figuration for them doesn't exist. But, but with John, it's rather strange. I'll talk about that later on. Um, but I've been, uh, I, I'm Professor Emeritus, or Emerita, at the University of Essex, History and Theory of Art. Sorry, is that, oh, you have to be that close, yes, okay. Um, Professor Emerita of History and Theory of Art at the University of Essex, but retired some years ago. I've been writing and curating exhibitions since then, um, very largely on surrealism or Latin America. And in the context of Latin America, I will have something to say about the relationship between abstraction and indigenous Native American art in the context of John Golding. Sure, thank you. Um, I wonder if you have had a, a moment to reflect on um, John's works uh, and their thoughts about Anton's so, and I'm going to just look through Rose Hilton's exhibition as well to compare the two. So I thought we would sort of examine these two artists' work um, through our time and just start into what Dawn said the idea of uh, surrealism, the precept of uh, figuration if you like, inspiring and blending abstraction or, or formulating its ideas for abstraction. Um, yeah, I wondered if we could twist and turn. And, um, there's more about this interactive work behind us. Um, in, in the form of abstraction, yes. Um, well, I think, um, I think that um, Anne, as you say, was very interested in space and in actually um, producing space on a canvas, showing canvas, um, showing that. Um, I think that if she was, uh, she spent a lot of time, what she used to do was um, fly around in very small airplanes um, from place to place, um, help um, teaching art in, in um, Queensland. And I think what she enjoyed very much was, was the thought of space and where the land and the the, the air joined together. Can you hear me now? Because it seems to have gone off. No, it's rather um, like that we're flying doctors. We, they had flying art teachers as well. Um, and um, I think in the, um, I'm looking at it, I think you can see that it is in fact uh, an abstraction of fat, but a fat of fantasy. And I think it was sort of the ideas of what 
came to her as she was flying, looking at um, looking at the other side, the sky and the earth, and um, then just having that wonderful thought. Very strange. It keeps on coming to Jane. Um, keep, uh, the wonderful thought of, of balloons and little aeroplanes and people falling out. Well, not people falling out of the sky, but people birds falling out of the sky. Um, and I think it was just very much from her imagination. She did a very, very, very large mural um, for um, the um, Queen's. I'm not here. But from Queens, uh, Queensland University, um, which was um, actually one of her very early works that was uh, gained a lot of recognition. And sadly, in the way that sometimes people don't understand about art, it was just destroyed. Um, and there's no record of And we've got photographs of it, but um, unfortunately, it's black and white photographs. Um, and it's just gone. But it was one of her very early and very strong works. Um, I think another thing that happened with Anne when she was actually painting, she was the way she entered the competition for, um, for painting, <laughs> painting <laughs> around, around uh, the um, the coast. All right, sorry, okay, the coast, um, and um, the there was a, she one of. One of the people who wrote about her, her entry said it didn't look at all like the didn't look at all like the uh, Queensland coastline, and it had to be explained that, that was not the idea. It was the impression of the Queensland coastline. Uh, yes, but it, it is fascinating to me how differently different people see a painting. Yes, and in some ways, the best way of looking at one is to be with other people and talk about it and look at it together. Because it, it is it is very interesting. We we read into things in different yeah. ways, and looking at this wonderful painting, which I'd never seen before, didn't know her work. I I saw space and distance from several different perspectives, and one was very specifically seeing a coastline. And to me, it's it's vividly there. <laughs> Isn't it strange? Yes. Um, you know, so much so that I'm sure it it may have been just chance, and that's another thing I want to ask um, Joanna about in a moment. But it seems that, that there is that. And then there is the sense of looking down into our space, space going back into perspective. Um, you know, I, I think it's a very it's a, it's a complex painting, as well as being, in the sense of abstraction, almost flat. Things come in and or resolve the canvas. Anyway, these, these are all different ways of looking at it. I'm always fascinated by how people um, Look at art, and and you um, look at a painting, and I think it it is a very personal way, and uh, particularly with abstract art, I think you can look at a painting, um, complete. I mean, everybody can look at it completely differently, get a completely different um, reaction to it. Um, I was the art curator in the children's hospital, and a uh, number of artists very generously gave me artworks, and I had one abstract work which I. Um, didn't I? I hung in um, staff area, and I had great complaints because somebody claimed they saw somebody committing incest and burning down a house. And I knew the artist, and I thought it's highly unlikely that had been in her mind. Um, and um, so I got her to come in and talk about what she was thinking about. It's something completely different. Nonetheless, the people who looked at it still saw what they wanted to see. And I think, I think that's. I mean, it's always interesting because um, I think that's what Anne feels. I mean, what she is painting is what she sees. What you read, what you see into it, is individual. And I think, I mean, unless you've got very figurative art where you know you've got a cup, a saucer, and on on a table or something like, or a person, a portrait, I think that. Abstract art makes your mind work. I, I mean, that's what I find so fascinating about it. You can look at something. Um, quite often, you can read the title, and it's absolutely nothing to you whatsoever, and probably only to the artist, only to Anne when she writes about something, something that she's been thinking about and doing. But what, how she, how you look at it, is your individual concept of it, concept of the work. I'm just 
the, um, the talk that you might have had a little earlier on, which was going to be on abstract expressionism, might have introduced the subject of automatism, that is, a certain kind of um, belief in unconscious gesture and that revealing something of what is in your mind, which was a huge influence on the American abstract expressionists when the surrealists brought it to New York in the 1940s. And I'm wondering, from your description of Anne's way of working, how far a notion of spontaneity was important to her process. Um, spontaneity is absolutely essential to her process. Um, as I say, she, she talks about jumping off a cliff, going into the void. Um, she genuinely has no idea what a painting will end up, or even why it will end up when it does. All she knows is, as she looks at it, as she paints, she will remove parts of it, as I say, straight it back and into something else, remove something that she feels has been intrusive into the work to make, and she wants to move, remove boundaries. Um, and only knows it's finished when she feels happy with it. Um, it's got nothing else, and it's got nothing to do with, um, you know, quite often in the community of galleries, they might say, you know, I want a blue painting, or I want a green painting, or something like that. But um, she, she I mean, all hands paintings, and I'm sure you can agree with that, are from what she has done, what's important to her, and um, the important thing is what she actually says, I finish it. This is what I wanted to say. Well, I'm not just thinking, um, I, I was going to take a possibly more controversial, is that working? Yeah, yeah. Contro controversial uh, question, position. Um, I've just been writing about a Mexican artist, Hero um, Landau, who was very, very abstract, but talked about the importance for her of a tradition that she felt also part of, of having predecessors. And I wondered, looking at Anne's paintings, I couldn't help considering whether Ashul Gorky was of any importance to her or Muriel, whether you, you could have seen them, she probably would deny it. But I, I just wonder whether there's a sense of predecessors. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know about Gorky, but um, I do think Miro. I mean, I mean, I think she would deny it. Um, but, and as I say, she also felt that she would work and she would try and prevent anybody else's work, you know, being uh, influencing her. But I, I think if we all go through life, particularly if you're an artist, I think you are influenced by, I mean, un subconsciously you're influenced. You're looking at somebody's work, you think, yes, I can understand how that, I like that, or I don't like that. And I think you can't avoid it. I mean, even though, as I say, she strictly says she's not influenced by anybody. But is there a difference between influence and influence? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, I mean, yeah, she has a, I mean, she, yeah, she really definitely has a great interest. Um, and as I say, there was an, an American, an exhibition of um, contemporary American artists that came to um, to Australia, which she saw. It's late, um, I think it was in the, it would have been in the early 70s, um, and the, um, or late 60s. And she was very, I mean, she, that, seeing those artists, Reichenberg and people like that, she did it, yeah. She liked very much, and we liked her work very much indeed. And it, it's interesting, I think the, the landscape of the figure never quite leaves the painting. No. Um, and that's quite a pain to sort of put in a basket alongside your, your point and all that, to sort of put it on this sort of um, thing. I don't question that, but I don't think either of us are going to leave the painting in that process. Um, I, I think perhaps not. I mean, great painting is. <laughs> yes, I think I, I think it has to be in a way, and so there's always this very interesting tension between an artist's sense of what they're doing, consciously or unconsciously, and the way the audience responds. And that's part of the excitement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
of the of the European night. Um, and I think that um, so I think that, that I mean I think that the, the way of we see things, the likeness that we see things, um, is very is very influential and I think that I think that that's true in Marin's work with the with the very, very strong colours that she uses. Some, 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 some you do. Scottish colours. Oh, yes. Uh, Scottish colours. Yeah. Very, very strong. Yeah. Very contrasting. Yeah. Yes. But the design schools, it varies. Sometimes you get strong colours, sometimes you get very soft ones. I mean, I noticed the differences in Rose Hilton's work. Even over the yes. you know, short period. Extremely different manners of working and using color. You sort of feel that color is that period. You sort of sort of you don't believe it did color flash. We were very good at gray. Very good at gray. Germany and then later in England about colour and how people react to it as well. Um, there's someone like Kandinsky, who's one, um, Kandinsky was one of the first people to really kind of write about painting, abstract yeah. painting, had very clear ideas about colour, not, not just the way that colours may recede or come forward on a canvas, but also their connections in some sort of more sort of spiritual sense to our emotions. Yeah. So it feels like that whole very strong watercolor, at least strong watercolor, and it's very very clear to me. Yeah. Yes. Um, we, we have just had a candidacy exhibition from um, the Guggenheim. Um, and it's um, and we've had one previously. Yes, I think Kandin uh, Kandinsky was um, very very involved with the use of color and the people's reaction to their colors as well. Um, it, uh, it meant a great. It, I mean, he, he again it was to do with music. He he felt that tone could you know that the musical tones and what he was putting on uh, the colors he was using on canvas on the canvas were the, were very important. Very connected. He, he linked particular colours to particular instruments too, yes. didn't he? And yeah. sounds, yes. Yes. Mm. Yes. What else did you do? With with the, with colours. Well of course there were there were attempts to make a sort of a complete work of art which involved actual sound and colour and so on. Yeah. The example of the um, Scriabin made an instrument that something happened. I can't remember how quite how it worked, but it involved um, sound and colour. And is that reflected on it? It's sort of sonic art, or does that have great, yeah. great the sound vibrations break a chain? The, uh, the yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, the, there's an exhibition on at the Tate Modern at the moment of um, German expressionists, and they do play uh, uh, music as well, looking at, and so looking at painting to see the connection. Or he, hoping you might see the connection. Yes, there's all, I mean, that has some great tendencies in it, actually. You mean the Blau Reiter? Yeah. 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 Blau Reiter. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a question from the back? <laughs> yes. Can I ask you how influenced are the paintings by their colors and the finish uh, or orange painting itself by the women? I can repeat the question. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> George, thank you very much. Um, but the question is, um, well, he's got the question. in reference to the, I suppose, the relationship that's called the Royal Paper, but the uh, influence of galleries may um, uh, have not had on the art without them. And um, I think I would qualify that as to say, regardless of galleries, your influence is your relationship to the world. Uh, and ultimately, it's got to connect. So what you make has got to speak to somebody. 
in some way, shape, or form, if part of that process that someone's going to say, you know what, I absolutely love to pass over a check in exchange for this, then you're going to have to think about that relationship if you're prepared to um, mitigate that and allow people to come towards you in time. And that's what the Google Gallery might help just to give you that length of time to really let those ideas stay through with an audience and to like frame steps or for you once you've had them to allow them to then go in and collect and find to you and follow. Because um, the hardest thing actually to find out is what follows on from having success. Um, because it's one thing to be successful to find it's been sold. The next thing is, well, what am I doing this for now? Am I doing this to repeat? So that's the hard thing. And that's where gallery is, if it's going to be so useful, it's going to say, just take a loop around, track, you know, don't even think about it, go, go left, go right, in, 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 think about it first. Because the idea is in that mindset. Um, so the very practical sort of advice my father gave, which was, do not sell work of art and pass it back as taxi. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so that was probably, probably about as much news as I've read. Um, so, uh, but yeah, the uh, yeah the relationship with Gary I hope is useful uh, in those in those contexts. Um, and yeah, and and you can use as well for everybody. I wish they'd say anything. <laughs> so the other half of my question is how oh. if the painter who doesn't come back to the same thing, is thinking about whether the painting is sellable. Ah, well, I, I, you would, I would classify the picture for the journal, the journal, because you don't actually press the picture for the gallery. That's all for your friends, um, your critics, and your community who allow others to pass that. Yes, um, I have to say I don't think, um, I do think they're better than I do, but I don't think an actual case of painting um, do sell. Um, obviously, she is extremely pleased when she does, and of course, that's incredibly important for all artists that their work does sell. But she's not thinking of that, and um, she's probably not even thinking of her audience either. She has created something that she wants to create for herself. And um, I think I, um, I think that's really very important. I mean, she, I'm sure she is guided probably by her, by her, um, her galleries um, to a certain extent, but it's certainly not what she doesn't sort of paint something being in your nose and sell. So, Mm -hmm. 
met on that was so long as we kind of feel that like getting back there, you're getting some help. Yes, I mean, I think um, Anne was absolutely delighted with when we had an exhibition for her. It, it's a great, uh, it's a great boost. I mean, all of you who are anyone here as artists know having an exhibition shows somebody enjoys your work, likes your work, believes in your work, and I think that is is marvellous. Um, and it, it is a great boost. Um, and certainly with Joan in England, with Joan Australian, particularly Joan Australian artists, when um, many Australian artists are, are not known here, um, and vice versa, and not many English artists are not necessarily known in Australia. But I think it's it is very it's very important and it does give you a very good boost. And I mean I know because she told me, you know, we were talking about paintings that she showed and she was very thrilled that she chose them though as well. Um, you know, it, 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 it's it's all as I say, it's it's a recognition that what you have done, what you have liked, and what really means something to you that somebody else appreciates that and is prepared to show it to other people. Well, I have to get on. We're going to do a questionnaire thing, but we need to hold in. Um, she may have to thank you for coming out to see us. Well, if I could get off, I'll get off. I can't tell you afterwards yeah. um, because I have to keep down with that. I don't know. I don't know. No, I, I could not tell you exactly. Oh, I couldn't tell you at all. I just need the, the number. <laughs> but this, this. to an audience from a gallery. A name is important. I've always felt um, people can relate to a name and, um, and know the art that comes with that name. And a gallery would be more interested in name or, or um, investors would be more interested in name. Um, I don't know how much the art counts. It must obviously count a lot, but a lot of the um, the private investors I've seen in the States and their homes where they've built a home around um, very large paintings and the paintings are terribly obscure. So, there we are. I think, I think okay. So I think we, so the general the sense is, is that um, person in the gallery is really interested in, in names, but the next or some of them are known. And I think you just take a step of that, just think about the art first. Uh, think about what's the name of the art before you go down that road. Um, and we have to find a little bit of this particular corner because there are lots of easy assumptions you can make along the way. Short handful of us. 
and then you come up with institutions for the for the for for gathering for the for the money uh for the last three months by the short last step. All of these like uh, are you know the part of good intent. Um we all know that they do. So <laughs> you have to um be rare about as well, not just gathering but to help people as well. That's a that's a better on scope and that's the key there. Um and on that the mass of white public on the same two masses, not the right collective, and so on the ground. So, so in this sense, we are coming out of war to this point that um, the two ways of learning are going to be in the right way. So, but it's important for us to have bring the context of this and then what's around the people who are active on the ground uh, today and recognize the shift again within um, Gary. Um, uh, I think this is about being understood, um, and it relates to something that was said earlier about titles, especially for abstract works. And I wonder what people's thoughts are about how important or even, dare I say, misleading about a title. Where does it sit within art? It's a very good question. Um, very difficult to answer in the sense of the titles can have so many different relationships to the thing, and some can be just descriptive, and some can be kind of fantastic, um, and some can just be poetry. Uh, but I, I don't know if there are any other things. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I can suggest something. Uh, I'm just trying to think of it. Um, the the artist I've been working with recently uh, tends to use neologisms of his title, the most invented words, invented titles. So we call one Coetion, which is <laughs> vaguely based on Descartes, you know, Cognito Ego Sum, but isn't quite. So you get titles of that kind, which just throw you off, <laughs> off your, your track. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's an artist in Australia, if you can name, who, um, when I was actually um, having to write about his um, work, um, I was cataloging his work, and I reckoned that the titles were longer than the art, um, longer the actual painting. And then the other ones who um, do no titles, and that's also, I mean, it's very difficult to when you're cataloging things like that to actually put no title, no title, no title. Um, you've got to work out when they can actually paint it to work out that way. I think titles are very interesting. Um, but again, I think it comes from what the artist actually wants, wants to do. And particularly with abstraction, I'm just thinking about it, of course, Kandinsky's only works with, with abstract ones. He used the term composition. Yes. It was sort of meant to be a bit neutral, but also had a musical connection, which again is very important. So otherwise, it's just the untitled, untitled. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'd like to mention uh, two moments in Australian art, and one, the artist Gleeson, he was a surrealist, he'd been doing it all his life completely alone out there, until the day when Dawn brought the surrealist exhibition into Sydney, where one Edmund Capon was the director. I felt that that was the moment when uh, Gleeson would have felt the cavalry has come to the rescue. And the other completely different thing, a picture called Blue Poles, which was bought by the Canberra Art Gallery for a great deal of money, causing a great deal of controversy, but yes. perhaps a turning point. I, any comment, please? Well, um, I think James Leeson's work, yes. I mean, he, uh, he I mean, I, I like his work very much indeed. Um, and um, 
I think it was very good when the art gallery did have an exhibition of his work. I think it's very interesting. And in fact, actually, he also, I think, entered one of the best um, so-called portraits, sold portraits, um, for the Archibald Prize, which is held every year, which, um, as you probably know. Um, and um, yeah, I thought his self-portrait, which in fact is very difficult to find out where James was in it, um, was actually one of the more interesting paintings that was shown. Um, I think with Blue Pearls, yes, there was a huge, huge outcry. I mean, the government, it was um, bought before the Camden Alley had been paid, uh, was built. So, um, and again, there was, a I mean, the government was, was um, I mean, the government made, I mean, there was a great deal of fuss about it. The government was sort of ridiculed that they should actually buy that painting. But of course, now it's actually proved to be one of the ones that people want to look at most there. Um, and I think it was great. It was a very, it was a very good move, move because, as I say, there still was a controversy about um, figurative and contemporary art, and I think that, I mean, abstract art, and I think that actually showed, um, you know, was very, was a brave, it was a very brave um, move by the, the James Morrison, who was the person who bought it. He was the director. Um, I, I wasn't in Australia then, I wasn't living there then, but um, I imagine it was probably a Labour government who were out to buy works of art. But I, I mean, I think another thing is when, when my husband was um, uh, the director of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, he spent what was then considered a huge amount of money on a, on a painting, I can't remember which one it was, and when he was asked you know, how to justify it. He said, well, it's probably less than you pay for a helicopter, and the helicopter won't last that long, and this painting will last forever. Um, could you say a little bit about how you would define abstract art? It seems to be used as anything that isn't figurative now. Um, in that Mir Miro was mentioned earlier as a possible influence on Anne, um, but his approach seems far more um, considered, considered and intellectual, um, abstracting from traditional art, from traditional pictures, and using those to see what worked as in balance. Whereas this work, this works, this work, <laughs> if you can hear me. <laughs> Um, seems much more emotional or a reaction or um, less less considered in, in that kind of way. It doesn't seem to relate to me. But I wondered if you could say a little bit more about the types of abstract art and, um, of, and how you would define them. <laughs> okay. Well, quick, quick go then. And I'll take it up. But just to do with Miro, first of all. Um, Miro is also a very various painter. And there are some works from the mid 20s when he was particularly close to, to the surrealists and was, you know, felt the idea of automat automatic gesture automatism was very valuable for him. And paintings like the very big painting called The Birth of the World is full of you know, groups and chance gestures and so on. So I think there are many paintings by him which are not considered in that sense that you are using it. But it's 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 very, very difficult to um, you know to give a precise definition of it. I mean where do you begin is one point. I mean I, I was once planning an exhibition at the Royal Academy and called Ten Stories of Abstraction. And that he began not from the nineteenth century, but kind of back in in sort of Islamic decoration and things like that. So there are all sorts of different ways in which you can trace you can trace histories of abstraction. When you when you have the very beginning of this century, which is where most of the art history in Europe has been, you have Kandinsky on the one hand and Mondrian on the other. So you have sort of three of them of abstraction and you have Mondrian with his you know apparently very, very precise, ordered, wonderful abstraction which leads into geometric abstraction. 
abstraction, which so many abstract artists rejected. So one, one's got, in, you know, there are internal oppositions in, in abstraction. There's an interesting recent book, which some of you may have seen by um, a New York art historian called Pepe Carmel, uh, where he argues that there's no such thing as abstract art. All abstraction has some sort of basis in, in a kind of reality. So I, I could go on, but I think. <laughs> That's a lovely way to yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think I think that actually is very is a very good explanation of it. I mean, on the other hand, you could say all oh, art is abstract because it isn't reality. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you know, in in I think that um, an artist. Well, as I say, Anne is trying to paint something that isn't in front of her, that she hasn't seen. She's trying to move away. Um, when this, with this painting with Miro, um, obviously she had been aware of Miro, but I, I think, again, as she said, she didn't want to be influenced by any one particular artist. Um, it was just the way that she happened to be painting at that particular period. And um, one fine person I met over there, and I'll ask your Russian this way. I, I, I think it's a great way to do a multiple drawn tour of art in Japan up to high school, but it, there's always a way in to the Japanese. Sometimes it's narrative, sometimes yeah. it's work, but it's yes. often seen as an abstract art, which is not easy and understandable for the people. Um, That's quite surprising to find the word real before we have to. Because, I mean, art isn't real. I mean, well, I mean, <laughs> sorry about that. I don't mean it isn't real, but it is actually representing something. Um, you know, what you what you see, what your eye sees. Um, if you're, you know, painting with a chair, it's actually not a chair, really. It's actually a one-dimensional, um, a di um, sort of work on the chair, and that's really abstract as well, if you like. So when you just push further. You can paint it in any way you like. You're just you're just moving through the fire. You can change. I was privileged once to be taken by Henry Moore to an exhibition of Alan Davy, and he asked me. I was about 17, 18, and he said, "What do you make of this?" And I said, "I've I said I've absolutely." What? Okay. Oh no! I mean, I, I mean, I think, I, I think, I, I do think you're influenced by other artists. I think every artist is. I mean, I, I mean, I, one of the, one of the joys I think is, is going around in, uh, an exhibition with artists because I'm looking at the painting one way and they're looking at it a completely different way. Um, they may not be influenced by the whole painting, but they will be influenced by how somebody has achieved something that they see in the painting. Um, I, I do think artists are influenced, and I'm sure Anne is influenced, but she tries very hard not to show the influence, I think is what, what I would say. Um, and she may not even be aware herself that she is. Um, but I, I, I think, and we're all, in, I mean, everybody is influenced by other things that you don't necessarily realize what what it happens to be, and I think artists are exactly the same. And it just makes you have the, the lovely point of being on the sort of rest of the day is that I think Henry Moore is the mind of saying you can how many times it can change your understanding of the brain to some extent. Yes. You will understand it by better and this in some cases what we found is there to my point of brain to some exactly my answer to my and then people in their own sort of voice story. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, it's also that last question.
question is that in that question? Because we're trying to cross the chain and have a discussion question. Um, <laughs> so if you uh, are saying that, that if you're saying that, yeah, um, say a product in code, but there's a long case as you go out for design to rectify. So um, do find a time, find a time in that conversation, uh, sit down with Ray, um, have a chat, have a conversation, and you'll come back at the end in about an hour and a half time, which is to keep the three names of the <laughs> 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 